Good morning, everyone. Um, the key to successful teach teaching is reinforcement. And so um, much of what you've heard, um, it's always good to hear it um, in a, again and a different perspective. And so, um, so this, uh, the next few minutes will be uh, looking at lower urinary tract control from a neurological perspective. Uh, what is the neural control for the lower urinary tract in health? And what f happens following a neurological injury? Now, if you take a step back, we're all dealing with continents and, uh, as our, in our profession, but if you take a step back and, and think about your visceral systems, the lower urinary tract is unique amongst the visceral systems for many reasons. Um, and one being uh, its high dependence on the central nervous system, um, and um, before, because of which this affords an element of voluntary control. So in contrast, you think of the cardiovascular system, where there's blood pressure and heart rate, where there is some effect of, of the central nervous system, but not so profound as on the lower urinary tract. And as a result, um, there are some basic functions that, uh, that are there uh, at birth. However, many of the functions of the lower urinary tract are acquired, and they're learned behavior over a period of time. And so if, the, if there is an insult to uh, the innovation that you've heard previously, at any stage during development, what happens is that this learned behavior is uh, not adequate and um, either um, an, a dysfunctional lower urinary tract um, emerges. Um, from a more basic perspective, the neural circuitry is different and um, it's more of sort of a phasic um, sort of on and off sort of a switch mechanism that you'll find for the lower urinary tract in contrast sort of the tonic activity that sort of regulates or controls sort of other visceral systems. Now, um, I once again start with the, the peripheral innervation. And um, it's um, essential to think about um, the, the innervation in the sense that because of the, the complex uh, central neural control, reflecting this is the complex in innervation. So you have two sets of nerves that innervate the bladder and the lower urinary tract. You have the autonomic nervous system and the somatic nervous system. And it's the autonomic system that sort of is involved in sort of the involuntary control of sort of visceral structures. And the, uh, the autonomic system essentially is represented by two arms. You have the sympathetic arm and the parasympathetic arm. So if, um, if, we, if we look at this uh, cartoon, um, you find the, um, the, 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 it's the, from the lower uh, segments of the spinal cord, so the lower thoracic, the lumbar, and the sacral segments of the spinal cord that the relevant innervation emerges. And uh, from the sacral cord, the second, second, third, and fourth segments, you have the parasympathetic uh, um, uh, fibers that emerge, and the sympathetics emerge from the lower thoracic and the upper lumbar segments. These form the hypogastric nerve, the parasympathetic nerves from the pelvic nerves. They um, sort of um, uh, synapse, and you get sort of what's called postganglionic segments, and these um, um, make their way towards the lower urinary tract. From the same sacral segments, um, you have also, from a different part of the spinal cord, you have uh, the somatic innervation that affords sort of a voluntary control of the sphincter. And uh, from the S234, you have the axons that emerge that form the pudental nerve. Now, once these reach the lower urinary tract, the, the parasympathetic nerve endings release uh, the neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Um, now, the, the somatic nerve also releases acetylcholine as well. And so it's the same neurotransmitter, but the difference here is a receptor. And so whereas the, the parasympathetic nerves, the acetylcholine is released and activates the muscarinic receptor at the, the sphincter and the bladder outlet, the acetylcholine acts on the nicotinic receptors. Uh, the, the sympathetic nerve fibers release noradrenaline, and these uh, will inhibit the beta-3 receptor, which you heard previously is of, of pharmacological interest. Um, and also they uh, can activate the alpha-1 receptors at the bladder outlet and the internal urethral sphincter. Now, the key here is the sacral cord, because much of the, 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 the axons that emerge and form these nerves arise from the sacral cord. But there are two distinct structures, and whereas a parasympathetic uh, axons emerge uh, from what's called the intermediate lateral horn, the, the ones that afford, afford sort of voluntary control, a little more anterior the onus nucleus. But what's quite important, therefore, is an injury to the lower cord, to the sacral cord, or to the fibers that emerge from the sacral cord called the cauda equina can result in quite profound bladder disturbances.
And a very important take-home point is that a patient who has injury to this part uh, might walk to you in clinic, might report very little neurological symptoms, perhaps a bit of numbness in the, in the saddle area, perhaps a bit of pain, maybe a bit of weakness in the hamstrings, but, uh, but often it's the bladder and the bowel and the sexual problems that are the brunt of the problems the patients report. And the reason being is that the fibers that uh, leave the spinal cord and supply the legs, the leg muscles have already left the spinal cord at this level. And it is, therefore, a large component of the, of the neurons in this, in this region are for uh, control of, 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 the, of the pelvic organs. So, for example, if it's a tumor um, that affects this area, or a massive disc prolapse that compresses the cauda equina, uh, or perhaps an accident, uh, uh, an injury to the conus medullaris can result in this. Now, um, what happens, of course, is that um, uh, you heard about the A-delta fibers and how these convey symptom, uh, the sensations of, 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 of bladder fullness in health. In disease, in addition, you have the C-fibers, which I'll not be going through further. And we don't know exactly how the, fi the, the signals from the bladder reach the brain. Um, there are various uh, neural tracts that subserve sort of bladder control. However, ultimately... Um, all of us in this room think about two things when our bladder is full. One, is it really full? Is it time to get up and leave the room and go to the toilet? Um, and is it the right time and the right place to void? And this involves um, various um, 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 uh, processes um, at, a, at, at a higher level um, that help to answer these questions. Now, the first point of relay of these afferent signals are in, in, a, in a structure that we call the brainstem which is actually the connection between the cortex and the spinal cord. There are various parts of the brainstem, and, and, and through the course of this morning, you'll be hearing about the pons and the midbrain. But we start with the midbrain, and you have the period aqueductal gray. And this is the point of relay for most, for, for most visceral sensations. But then they, they then emerge, uh, the, the signals then relay on to, to various parts of the cortex. Now, in the last 15 to 20 years, with the advent of functional uh, brain imaging, a wealth of information has become available about the central processes that are important for uh, the perception of bladder sensations and to ask the question about appropriateness to avoid. Now, what's um, a, a critical part is one part uh, of, the, of the cortex that's actually buried deep uh, between the frontal and the temporal lobes that we call the insula. For many, many years, for centuries, people didn't recognize the importance of the insula it's an island, as you would make up from the word, which has emerged in this deep fissure, and it was thought to be of inconsequential, uh, inconsequential. But now we know that it has an important role in brain, in brain imaging. So from um, um, various centers, such as from Pittsburgh and from Zurich, and various centers where people have ca carried out sort of brain imaging studies using either PET or functional MRI, people have identified consistently when, that when the bladder is filled um, and when the patient perceives that they have a full bladder, that consistently areas such as the insula actually um, uh, light up or activate, as you can see in red. Um, and, um, and what's known is that the afferents from the midbrain are mapped in, uh, directly onto this insula, and it's the sensations uh, that are perceived at the level that form the basis of the sensations of bladder fullness. Now, another part of the brain is actually um, uh, on the inner side of the brain, a part of the, called the, we call the limbic cortex, uh, and it's called the cingulum, or the cingulate cortex. And, um, and, and this part of the brain is associated in general with motivation and the affective aspects of interoception, which are sort of the perception of your visceral sensation. So this is in general what um, the, the cingulum does. Um, and it sort of um, correlates to sort of the, the limbic motor cortex, and it monitors uh, sort of the, the bladder as it's being filled. Um, there's, a, there's an inhibition on the brain stem from this area, as the bladder is getting full. And with more and more filling, what happens, shown in, 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 in imaging studies, is that lighting up the red signals that you saw actually proceed more anteriorly. And this is supposed to correlate with that sensation of, of unpleasantness when one has a, a full and bursting bladder. Um, um, in disease, which I'll not be covering um, uh, much, um, there are therefore distinct patterns of brain activity that one might find. So, when the, um, so in, 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 in experiments where patients have reported urinary urgency, uh, there is sort of, um, uh, and uh, with, uh, with large filling, there is sort of a, a, a large areas of activation of the, of the cingulum. Uh, 
Um, we, we heard about so the prefrontal cortex, and it uh, has an important role. It's the decision maker, which sort of uh, the medial prefrontal cortex sort of decides whether it is appropriate to void or not, and um, and uh, has an important role in the continence mechanism. Now, uh, it was Barrington in the 19th century during his um, study, or in, in the early 20th century, who actually carried out a series of experiments where they ablated um, brain sections and in, in, uh, made sec cuts in the sections of the brainstem and showed that below a particular area that actually the cat uh, uh, went into retention. And it became clear that there was a center in the brain that was responsible for voiding. Um, several years on, uh, Bertel Bloch and his group have actually demonstrated um, individuals who've been able to successfully pee instead of a scanner that this area called the Pontine Micturition Center that you heard is actually a prime important a prime importance in, um, in, 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 in initiating voiding. So essentially, if you look at it in a very simplistic manner, there's the lower urinary tract control is essentially two neural programs. You have a storage phase that you heard and a voiding phase. And you have two players in these programs. You have the detrusor muscle and the sphincter. And if you think about it in health, all of our bladders are in the storage phase for more than 99% of the time. And whereas in the storage phase, the detrusor muscle is relaxed and the sphincter muscle is active, um, in the voiding phase, the, the detrusor muscle is active and contracting and the sphincter muscle is relaxed. And the switch, of course, is the pons and the various um, input um, um, that sort of feed into the pontine micturition center, uh, that sort of the switch, that sort of phasic between storage and voiding phase. Now, you've already seen this diagram, but just once again to reiterate and reinforce the fact that the, PA, the, the midbrain is the first point of relay of afferent sensations. The medial prefrontal cortex is, plays an important role in inhibiting the, 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 the brainstem centers in, during the storage phase so that we don't become incontinent in health. And, um, and what happens in voiding is that there's sort of a safety switch from the hypothalamus that lifts that inhibition we have facilitator singles from the prefrontal cortex. The, the previously inhibited pontine micturition syndrome is now activated, and there are facilitatory signals that, that run down the, through the neural tracts in the spinal cord. There's a relaxation of the urethral sphincters and the pelvic floor, and a contraction of the detrusor muscle, and lo and behold, the person voids. Um, so, um, what, what, therefore, if you look at a sort of a hierarchical control of the lower urinary tract, the cerebral cortex is important, therefore, from the point of view of sort of bladder, the perception of bladder fullness and sensations, and in health, of course, pain, the timing of micturition, whereas the brainstem, as you can see, is involved in sort of the coordination of reflexes. The spinal cord is involved in amplification of signals that are ascending up from the lower urinary tract to the, bladder, to the brain, uh, and the signals from the brain to the lower urinary tract, so the afferents and the efferents, and the peripheral nerves are involved in the relay. Now, this leads me to uh, the next talk, um, and I'll, I'll leave you at this sort of a, 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 a neurological sort of hierarchy based upon this understanding of the lower urinary tract control. And so you know examples of lesions that are above the pond, such as stroke and Parkinson's disease, lesions that affect the spinal cord, such as multiple sclerosis and trauma, and lesions that affect the sacral cord, as I mentioned earlier. And, um, and so Thomas will then sort of take you what happens in neurological disease, and how there are distinct patterns of lower urinary tract dysfunction depending on where the lesion is. Thank you very much.